somebody very tall was in my seat. We're going to call the committee to hold meeting to order Tuesday, March 1st, 2005, right at 5.44 p.m. Councilman Laws is present, Councilman Hodge, Vice Mayor Bill, Councilman Porter, Councilwoman Garner, and Councilwoman Wellman present. <coughs> Approval of the committee to hold Finance Park and Rec Public Safety Committee meeting minutes. Of February the 15th, 2005, with a motion for approval. Okay. Move by the vice mayor. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Hodge. Questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Item 2 is the adoption of a resolution opposing the wireless le legislation. <laughs> Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, we have uh, City Attorney uh, George Cruz Castillo. Is that That's the correct. pronunciation? Uh, here to explain uh, why we are recommending opposing this legislation. Council members, my name is George Cruz Basile, Assistant City Attorney's Office. The resolution before you uh, is designed to oppose wireless legislation presently pending in Tallahassee. That legislation preempts all local zoning authority with respect to the placement of towers and antennas. Uh, the rights that the cities will lose is that you cannot restrict the height of towers and antennas. Towers and antennas can be placed wherever they want. There's no restrictions on the size of cabinets, uh, which usually go at the bottom of buildings or other towers, a water tower. There's no restriction on the density, meaning you could have a, a large accumulation of, of cabinets that presently under the code you can restrict on aesthetic concerns. All aesthetic restrictions that the code, the city's code currently has would be preempted. In effect, without listing all of the rights the city would lose, uh, it's uh, easy to say that this bill will preempt all of your local zoning authority with respect to those towers and antennas. And we're uh, recommending to the city that it uh, adopt this resolution uh, to oppose this legislation. Mayor, I'll move to adopt this resolution. Moved by the Vice Mayor. Is, <coughs> is this the same bill that was proposed last year? Yes, Mayor. This is the same bill, except this time they made it worse. <laughs> And do you know who the sponsors the bill? Um, uh, no, 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 and the Florida League, we have their support on opposing this the bill? The Florida League of Cities has not taken a position on it. Um, the Dade County delegation um, it has not come out against it. And what we are recommending to um, for the city is adopting the resolution to inform the, the, uh, the Dade delegation that, in fact, this legislation should be opposed. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Porter. I can take it up Thursday. This, this Thursday is a is a Florida League, I mean a Dade League meeting, so I can take the resolution forward. Yeah, we appreciate it, Jeff. We oh, uh, the sponsor support we can get. I think this is really just a oh right. Oh, the sponsors from Dade. No, they're not from Dade. The sponsors are not from Dade. If that was a question for the city manager. Nobody we know that I'm aware of that the sponsors I mean, here. Obviously, this is an issue that affects a lot a lot of different cities. Um, cities are taking basically two approaches. One is the is basically to do the best that they can, um, watering down the legislation in case it passes. Some cities are taking the position that the way it's been watered down, they're okay with it. Is what Gary Resnick is telling me. Some are taking the position that they don't, you know, they won't. It's unacceptable altogether. Um, and you know, to the extent that we can help with the lobbying effort up there. The count, you know, in terms of the council going up to Tallahassee and Bob Levy, you know, maybe we could be in uh, contact with Bob Levy to to put this on his list for our city. If I may, what I, what I can do too is is get a get a sense of the feel of what the the day league is going to do based on this upcoming meeting, and bring that back to the council and to know whether or not the day league is going to take an aggressive position against it or a passive position and. They've been known to do both. Yeah. So we're we're representing a. Um, co I think 
think somebody's so phone is near the light. So? Blackberries. It's your, it's your Blackberry, Richie. Do you think it's mine? I blame it's yours. Why? I'm turning my thing off here. I didn't do anything. Richard. Move it away. Move it away. Move it away. Move it away. I just turned it off. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Wow. It's the cell phone industry trying to interfere. Well, I'll turn it off. All right. Um, well, we, we're representing a coalition of 12 cities in turn, uh, that basically to try to rewrite the legislation so if it pa passes um, that it's watered down. Um, but I think that if the, if the city wants to take another step, and some of our clients are, they're contacting their lobbyists and trying to, you know, putting it on their list of, of bills that the city's against. And I think that, that if that, that's where you are, I think that Bob Levy is the right approach. But um, there are cities are are, uh, are aware of this, and it'll be interesting to see what the data leak says. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Item three is the proposed change to the PUD minimum size requirement. All right, so, uh, Mr. Coker, are you ready to go now, or would you? No, I'm, just, I'm fine right you're, now. You're ready. Ready to go now. Okay, Mayor. Uh, this is a proposed change to the PUD minimum size requirement. I think we have some discussion on that. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Laprade is ready to uh, present the staff's position on that. Would you like me to go first or Mr. Laprade? Hmm? It's Mayor's call. There. Let, let's get the staff um, input and then Mr. Coker. Right. Um, Mayor, members of council, um, staff recommends changes to the minimum acreage of the requirement for PUD developments per the applicant's request. But this recommendation is contingent upon the following conditions. Number one, that the minimum size is not decreased below 20 acres. And number two, that additional changes to the PUD land development regulations as proposed by staff, which we're currently working on, be incorporated and that this development not be exempt from those changes. We have um, been updating code as requested by Council and the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, and we will have changes to the PUD code coming. We've been working on those quite a bit. We, we did other changes at the first of the year that we felt were a little bit more needed and have been continually working on the PUD code. Um, and we will be bringing those forward under the Code Revision Committee. So what we, advantages in adopting these recommendations? Well, if, if Council will remember, the PUD minimum size used to be 10 acres. And when we did the first moratorium in the city um, back in 2003, 2002-2003, one of the um, one of the recommendations under that moratorium was that PUD size be increased to 50 acres, so that that could aggregate a lot of that open space that we had out east, and that's exactly what occurred into large-scale developments that that were lended a more cohesive look and feel in that area so you didn't have a lot of hodgepodge different development. We don't have the luxury of having those large pieces anymore. So size of property has decreased. We're looking more internally into the city. Currently under the PUD code, property fronting Campbell, such as the one that they're specifically looking at in this issue, um, can be 30 acres. It's not what they have. Uh, but we, there are several properties around the city that might be in the 40, the 20 to 40 acre range, uh, you know, under the 50 allowed to be a PUD that could work in a PUD scenario. Um, that can allow for that mixed use and, 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 and different, different types of development within that PUD. So we feel that kind of taking a step back and moving back to the 20 acres, not necessarily to the 10, but to the 20 is not a bad number. We just think that it needs to be coupled with our newer PUD code as opposed to the one that's from 1975. So. Question from council to the staff? I do. Vice Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Charles, we had gone, um, as you said, from 10 to 50, and then, in, in, if I remember correctly, in the CRA area, it's 30. That is correct. So this yes. is in the CRA area. <clears throat> this is not in the CRA area. So, no. 
This would be fronting Campbell. It was if you fronted Campbell or were in the CRA area, it would be 30. Okay, so we're going from 50 to 20. Yes. So we're exactly. talking. No, this okay. is in the, no, this is in the, the 30 acre area. It's in the 30 acre fronting Campbell. It's not right. in the CRA, it's, right. it's a fronting Campbell. It's, it's either or. Yeah. In the CRA or, or fronting yes, Campbell. Exactly. It's the or. Yes, okay, yes, so, yes. so it's 30 acres. And, and what's the density on this? It's, it's medium and medium A portion flush. of it's medium and a portion of it's like commercial. Um, like commercial but, but really, you really shouldn't look specifically at a piece of property. I mean, as a code change, right. it should be just in general. Right. Uh, and, and as I said, there are other properties that are similar to this size around the city that, that this could work well with. A PUD could work well on. So Has the developer agreed to all of your stipulations in exchange for this variance? No. No. <laughs> no. I don't know that that offer was made, but no. Yeah. It's, uh, you know. Okay, that's that. Now I'd like to yeah. hear from the developer. That's not that. I mean, it's my turn. <laughs> okay. Let me ask to see if any, any questions from Mr. Lawson? Yes, thank you. Charles, I, yes. under our current PUD rules, if this 20 acres was subject to being a PUD, is there a percentage of it? What's the maximum percentage that could be residential? All we're showing right now is predominantly, um, it's predominantly the underlying land use. So if it takes in the portion that's medium density and the portion that's like commercial, <coughs> it's about a third like commercial and two thirds medium density, the majority would have to be residential. It doesn't say whether it's 56%, it doesn't say whether it's 75%, it doesn't say whether it's 110, you know. So there's no specific numbers. So I, I guess my concern is, and without trying to sit here and do math off the top of my head, we could have effective density of well over 15 units per acre as for this particular scenar scenario. So we well, have the drastic right. reduction in acreage. Under the PUD, uh, and under the PUD scenario, um, density has been looked at over the entire I understand that. Property of the PUD. You know, effectively less dense, the larger the PUD. That's, that's correct, yes. Thank you. Any other comments from council? <coughs> it's like it's just the back door. There's glare coming around. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Coker? Thank you. Um, uh, Dick Coker representing uh, the, I guess, the developers of the Sunny Lee property that's been around for a couple of years. I'm, I'm here with, with Tim Williams of Williams Agricultural Enterprises who've been working on this project really for a couple of years in, uh, in assembling property over in the eastern area, talking about um, uh, the, P, uh, the development of the property as a, as a PUD and talking about the PUD ordinances. Um, <clears throat> we're asking at this point, we, we've filed an application to amend an ordinance to change the, the, uh, the minimum size in this particular area from 30 to 20 acres. Uh, let me tell you, um, I, I work in dozens and dozens of jurisdictions and I've written uh, over a dozen zoning codes in, in my former life as a, as a consultant to cities and counties. And I've written a dozen PUD ordinances. Um, and I'll tell you, I've never seen a PUD ordinance that's a downside for a city. I have seen nothing but flexibility provided by a PUD ordinance. In fact, virtually every city uh, that I'm familiar with and do work in, I do work in dozens of them, uh, even if they have a minimum size. And some of them have a minimum size of 20 acres, some of them 10, some of them 5. Uh, I've never seen one 50. Uh, but even if they have that minimum uh, area, they have criteria that allow you to go below the minimum if it's determined by the city council that a PUD is appropriate. Because unlike traditional zoning, traditional zoning, you have an entitlement. If you're zoned uh, RM1 or RM6, there is a, an entitlement. You, you can build units under the zoning code and under the land development regulations. And it may not be exactly what you want, but you have an absolute entitlement under the land development regulations to build those units with those numbers, with those setbacks, without any architectural enhancements unless they're specifically laid out in the code. PUDs are different. PUDs are entirely discretionary on this council. 
You don't have to approve a PUD. There's no developer that can come up here and threaten you with a lawsuit if you don't approve a, th a, a PUD. If you don't like a color, if you don't like uh, uh, the number of units, if you don't like the open space in a PUD, you don't have to approve it. A, a PUD is a flexible device that allows a developer some flexibility in, the, in his design and it allows the city to, uh, uh, to give bonuses, really, for good design, allows for uh, connectivity and integration between commercial and residential. And in every case, I've never known a circumstance in 30 years I've been doing this in which a PUD is, is less of a quality development than a, a regular zoning. It, it, in all cases, it ends up with more open space, more common open space, better design, a better uh, uh, recreational systems. In every respect, a PUD is more desirable for the city. Of course, it, it would, it's more desirable for the developer, too, because there are trade-offs. He's getting, usually he's getting a little bit more density. And usually he gets to build in, under different land development regulations, his setbacks are different, uh, maybe some parking ratios in the higher density areas are, are different, but developers have trade-offs have trade too. But in every case, city evaluates those trade-offs and determines whether or not that city wants to approve that PUD. And if you don't want to approve it, you can change the colors, you can change the, the number of trees. You can't do that in a, re in a regular project. If, a, if somebody comes up here with a land use, with, with a uh, site plan approval, and he's got one tree every 30 foot feet, just like your code requires, you can't ask for another one. That, but in a PUD, you can ask for as many as you want if you feel it's appropriate in order to, uh, for that development to meet what you consider to be the appropriate criteria for a PUD approval. The reduction, as Charles said, <coughs> Your acreage has now been taken up with the large PUDs. All, you really don't have uh, that many more large tracks. And you've got to focus on the tracks that you do have, which are east. And in the east, you don't have the larger tracks. You have 10, 20, 30. And Charles says there's some 40 acres around, although I'm, I'm sure there are. <coughs> but I, I think it would be short-sighted if the city was to think uh, was to prohibit the PUD type of development in any place in the city. We've asked for a reduction to 20 acres because that happens to be the size that our client owns. Um, there's nothing magic about 20 acres because a 20 acre site is just as appropriate for a PUD as a 50 acre site or a 10 acre site. But what we have before you today, it seems like everybody is uh, feels pretty good about it, is a 20-acre minimum. But I want to urge you to, to understand that you don't lessen your ability at all to create quality development. You increase it. You don't lessen your ability to require enhancement ar to, uh, architecturally, barrel tile roofs, pavers on the, on the sidewalks and things like that, things you could never ask during the normal site plan and zoning process because you have entitlements under those processes. You don't have entitlements under the PUDs. All the PUDs that you've seen recently goes to the Planning and Zoning Board. They've asked for traffic calming. And they've asked for uh, sidewalks and, and, and crosswalks. They've asked for paver enhancements. They've asked for additional landscaping. That's all that's all because this is a PUD and that you have the ability to ask for those things and get those things uh, with, with the PUD. That brings me, the point I want to make here is the staff is recommending approval of, uh, of this PUD ordinances, uh, but it's subject to uh, compliance or this project not being grandfathered in for some future um, PUD regulations that uh, I guess are being promulgated now. Uh, I don't know what they are, but at some point they're going to be processed. And it's my suggestion to you is I think it'd be appropriate to deal with those issues when they come up. 
when when that ordinance gets presented to you for evaluation some people are going to agree with it some people are going to disagree you're going to make a decision you're also going to make a decision on on what projects the, uh, that ordinance applies to and when this particular project comes through the process and it's in PNZ I'll go to PNZ soon um, the, the PUD and the PUD ordinance amendment to reduce it from 30 to 20 will be traveling along at the same time you make a choice when you adopt that PUD whether or not something that's in the pipeline would apply to this PUD or not we ask you to not to at, at this point before we even know what restrictions are or what the what the uh, what the ordinances that the staff are, is preparing now we ask you before <coughs> we have all that information don't saddle us with, with something we don't know anything about you have the opportunity at the time the PUD is adopted probably in May sometime is when this thing will come before you you have that opportunity to make your choice to decide whether or not uh, to apply new regulations and even if the staff has not finished their PUD ordinance but if there's something that you think is important you have the opportunity with or without any modifications to the PUD ordinance to impose them if you think they're appropriate uh, by, by the vote of the council. So what we'd ask you to tonight is just to allow this to go forward in its, in its existing form as um, uh, a reduction from 30 to 20 in two places in your code just as proposed. When it comes up for, to you for final adoption you'll make a decision. You'll make a decision on the Sunny Lee PUD. You'll make a decision on this ordinance. But we think that's the appropriate way to go, just to let it go forward the way it's proposed, and you can make a decision when it comes back up to you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Mr. Hodge. Thank you. I have a, a question for Charles. Um, Charles, yes. this, making this change is, would be changed for citywide, pretty much, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. Now, we're doing it basically for this one particular reason or uh, issue and not knowing whether there's going to be more to follow up behind. I'm but sure there will be more. Yeah, me too. All right. And, uh, <laughs> all right. and, I've uh, already spoken to him. I'm, oh, I'm almost guaranteed there's going to be more. So basically we will be op basically open up some floodgates. That's exactly correct. Right. And and one thing I want council to understand is this particular parcel of property is undergoing a land use change that's not approved by the state yet. And until that's approved, this can't take place. It's that same group that was sent up with the Southwest Master Plan changes and all the other changes that we just did at the first of the year. So you're a couple months away from that actually being finalized by the state. Um, hopefully not that long, maybe it's just a month. We feel that we can have the PUD changes to you before then. Um, so I don't see an issue with the timeline, pretty much. Um, but the, the situation is, yes, you're going to open up the floodgates. There are many items that this council, as well as the Planning and Zoning Board, has asked staff to make changes to code for. And that's what we're doing. And we don't think that it's at least staff's opinion is it's not appropriate to grant one change with not everything else coming along with it. So that's that's why staff's position is what it is. Okay. And I guess to follow up with that would be looking at looking at uh, making this this change and and keeping the consistency by again with with what comes along mm -hmm. what what in essence would be the negative impact or what would be um, what is it that the city would be given up or would we actually be gaining or is it a positive impact by making this change um, by making the change to 20 acres I think it is a positive impact. Um, I, I think we've done what we set out to do, which was which was aggregate all those large acreages into, into large developments and kind of set that patchwork, you know, so you don't have a patchwork quilt on the east side. You have large, cohesive, 
you know, plan developments. Um, we just don't have that luxury left on land, so if we want to allow that mix, if we want to allow those benefits that are there, you know, to the city and to the developer for a PUD, we have to lessen the acreage. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, it's one reason we looked at decreasing it. I'm not saying that we go to the 10 that it used to be. Our comp plan says we should even look at mini puds at five acres. I don't know. That's something we'll look at in the future. Um, but I, we can agree with the 20. I know 20 was discussed on numerous occasions going through code changes with the planning and zoning board, and they felt fairly comfortable with that, you know, in discussions. And, and I, that's why we haven't had an issue with the 20, and I think it fits in the framework of what we're doing in the remainder part of the city in the open space that's left. Okay, so I guess what the real heart of the question would be is what what would be the the negative impact of reducing it? Um, I don't know that there will be a negative impact. I, I think uh, at least what what I'm understanding and 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 what staff's trying to put forward and what I'm seeing from different boards and everything is that people want to look at mixed use development. Right now, PUD's about the only way to do get that done. So if you if you want to have those that ability for mixed use development, then we need to make it feasible to work on the land mass that we have left that's vacant. So. Michael, I have my. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Garner. Oh, there's me. Ms. Garner, was you? Oh, was you? Ms. Yeah. Garner, and then oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, under the Code Revision Committee, we are working on PUD improvements. There were many issues we were looking into, and we were going to include with that reducing the size to 20 acres. The reason that this was brought forward to you is because the applicant's property is 20 acres, and they want it done so they can start on their project. I don't think that we should have one project allowed to go ahead when we have all these improvements we were going to bring together. We're doing this as a favor to them to start on their project. And Mr. Lapad and I were planning on finishing some of those items this week so we could get it to planning and zoning, get it back to council as soon as possible. So the, this is not being delayed. We've been working on this, and we're trying to bring it to you as soon as possible. And we were very close to finishing. So, so what is your recommendation as chair? As, as a chair, I would say to approve it as staff has requested. Uh, we will bring you the additional PUD items as soon as possible, and everyone will have to follow those rules. No grandfather. No grandfather. These are positive improvements. We all know POD, PUDs are good things, but we can make them even better. And that includes reducing it to 20 acres. The project would be allowed. There, there, if I might, there, there will be benefits, not just to the city, but also to the developer and the, and the changes. I mean, we, we see a list. When PUDS comes through, we see a list of variances that people always want to have. And some of those are being incorporated into it, so it's not a variance anymore. But there's, you know, give and take, and that's and that's what we want to have. Let Ms. Let Ms. Walman and then Chill. Ms. Walman. Um, I, I'm a little confused. Um, you're saying no grandfather. Are there projects right now in the pipeline that have already started the process that would be affected by this? <laughs> that have spent money on the process and have gone through. The, the traditional process? <laughs> the people at the podium had applied for a 20 acre PUD. 20 acres? Keep in mind that 20 acre is not allowed. So they asked for a variance to the 20 acre PUD. You can't get a variance to the 20 acre PUD because it's, you, unless you meet a hardship, they don't mean a hardship, it's a self imposed hardship. It is at least under staff's, uh, under staff's I, I want to take it step by step because I think maybe some people in the audience might be confused and, too. And also on their property that we're talking about is currently land used as light commercial, the right. entire piece. Right, and they're asking. They've asked for land use change, which this board approved. light commercial and medium right. density, correct? Which this board approved. It has not taken the final steps through the state yet. We have not been notified that that has been accepted. So I think a lot of what they've done is jumped ahead. Now, we've accommodated them in reviews and things like that, but always notifying them that, A, it can't be 20 acres, and B, you don't have the land use approved. But if we pass so. this tonight and they do get their approval from state, is that going to affect them in any way? <coughs> that, that it's going to be a detriment to them in any way? I don't think so. 
Do you feel that way, Mr. Coker? <coughs> It'll be more expensive for them. Oh, we're we are going to add new requirements to the PUDs that are going to make the the product better, which may be more expensive for them. Um, but they they better. have no right to do what they're doing right now. Is the point I'm trying to make? Okay, what is it that they're? I, I want you to tell me directly. What well, is it that they're doing what, that they have no right to be doing? Not that they don't have any right. Well, they applied for sketch plan approval of 20 acre PUD. Right, with the city. And asked for a variance to the PUDs, minimum PUD size requirements. Right. Staff has consistently denied their variance. It hasn't progress much further but and why is that why has staff denied this? because we have a specific set of rules on how a variance can be granted and they're not and, and it's a rules. hardship there's an eight-step hardship rule and we do not feel that they meet that hardship number one is their hardship is self-imposed because they don't have to be a PUD they can be something else we're not stopping them from developing number two their land use is not medium density at this time that is something that's being applied for. It's gone through the channels here. It still has to be approved by the state. It has not been approved by the state. Okay. So, I just I, what I'm yeah. trying to get to the bottom line is, you know, Mr. Coker stands before us and says that you know implies that that if we pass this, that we will no longer have the option to to be. Um, uh, critical as far as, I'm just going to use the example of trees, if, if somebody went to plant a tree every 50 feet, you're saying, I believe, I, I understood you to say that we, you wanted to allow us to have the freedom to either turn down or to accept. That's, and that's what a PUD does for you. Exactly. Now, I'm not saying that this that would change. not allow that at all. I'm just saying that the PUDs are such a good thing that gives you the flexibility. Exactly. So, regardless of who's standing at the podium, I just want to make sure that there's not, you know, that small developer, that's that, that person that's maybe been working with the city for six months or a year, that has been, you know, working hard to move forward, and will this shut them out? I mean, this, this, this concerns me. There are... Uh, and I, I don't know who they are, I don't know how many there are, but I'm sure there are some. There are current... We'll see. There are no 20 acre PUDs allowed in the city right now. Pardon me? There, there are no 20 acre PUDs allowed right. in the city right now at all. I know. So um, I, I don't see how it hurts anybody. Okay. So you're saying there's nobody in the pipeline? I, there have been people, the people right there have applied, A, for a variance to the 20 acre minimum, and for a pod that can't be done on the current existing land use until that's changed. Give us comment on, on it, even though the land use hasn't been amended yet. We're not arguing about the, the the staff has been very accommodating to allow the land use to go forward while they're reviewing it as if the land use was approved. We appreciate all that. Um, <coughs> We do think, we did apply for the variance, we do think that we can meet the standards. The staff has a right, like anything, to make a recommendation to this commission who is the ultimate determination on whether or not we meet those standards, including the self-imposed hardship. I think we can meet that standard. That's your determination. They recommend one way or the other to you. But when we went through DRC and we discussed the variance, and the staff's reluctance to recommend approval of the variance, even though they didn't, they didn't have a problem with the 20 acres. Then we discussed, well, we'll just ask for a code change and, and, um, and bring it all up together, and the council will ultimately make a decision. Well, variance, if you want to give it, a code change if you want to give it, the PUD approval if you want to give it. It's, it ultimately comes to your desk, and you make a decision on the project completely, on every aspect of it. If I could add a little Mr. more. Vice Mayor and Mr. Oh, can I just finish my comment, Mayor? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The, the, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Williams. Okay. I didn't mean to no, interrupt you. But, but, but I'm, I, I'm just going to say my final thought here, and that is that they did, it, and as in the letter that was in our package, it says um, that um, the amended application that has been approved by the City Council on the first reading to change the land use from light commercial to a combination of light commercial and, and medium density. Now, and, and, and then it goes on to say in anticipation of the final approval. I just have a problem doing things when, in midstream. I, I, I just think we should 
you know, what is the urgency that, 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 that one month is going to make? I mean, I just don't understand this urgency, and I want somebody to explain it to me, but I just don't like the fact that when somebody has already come before the council, that we've proved for them to go ahead and apply for this, for this uh, thing with the state. I can't think of the right word right now. But I just, I just want to know what's the urgency that we have to do it right now? With no disrespect, please. You know, I just, I just want to know well, why. Ms. Wallman, members of council, they did not apply for the land use change. That was a city land use change. Um, we, we changed that whole area on Long Campbell on both sides. Um, they have applied for a PUD that under current code, it's staff opinion that they don't have the right to have, unless council deems to grant a variance that staff's recommendation will not be to grant. The expediency is from the applicant and not from staff. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, their hurry, obviously, is is um, financial and, and, and market driven. Um, staff has been working on code changes, um, the entire code, not just this part. And this is one of the parts that we have been working on. And we don't think that anybody, um, especially when their property is in limbo now, should be exempted from the changes that everybody's going to have to follow. So that's that's why our our opinion is what it is. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. He knows I was over here chomping at the bit. Um, it's it's very clear to me that what we have here is we have a process. We have a process that has been started by the city. We have code changes, and we've been undergoing these changes in a proper and in an appropriate and in a proper fashion. I think it's improper. I'm just going to say it right out. I think it's improper for council at this time to go ahead and give you guys a special um, exemption, if you will, go ahead and change this for you at this time without going ahead and accepting the special conditions that are going to have to be blanket across the board in order to get this type of a change in a, in a reduction of, of area and in a reduction of acreage for a PUD. I just think it's inappropriate. You have um, you have you have code. We have staff. We have um, people in place for this, and I and. I, as soon as I read it, I, I just knew this this is just not appropriate. And so I, I'm going to just right now say I would oppose this at this time. I think it's it's, it's presumptuous. I think it, it jumps ahead of staff. It jumps ahead of code. And I think it's inappropriate. So um, I would really recommend that we not go with this at this time. I think everybody should um, wait appropriately. I don't think you have a hardship. I don't think there is any reason for you to get a special exemption. I think there are specific conditions that have been placed upon you that you're not willing to accept at this time. Um, and I think we should just wait. And I think everybody should wait. So, um, Mayor, that, that's where I stand on that. Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mr. Hodge. Yes. And Mr. Porter. Uh, uh, Mr. Corker. <coughs> Or, or Tim, uh, thank I think I think Judy Wallman uh, basically uh, hit it on the head, and, and that's the, and that's probably the the, the thing that, that pulls my chain uh, because of the fact that we have our, our chair of a code that's saying that a lot of those changes are already being implemented and, and coming on, and 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 Charles is saying you know we've we've got it in the bag, we just hadn't got it yet, and. And then they're saying, you know, basically, you're you're you're, you're jumping out of the gate first, you know. Okay. And uh, really, what we need, to, what what I need for me is 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 again, what is the sense of urgency? What is the what is the benefactor of? Thank you, that, thank you uh, Councilman Hodge. I, I appreciate the question. I, I've I, I think we somehow got a little turned around, um, and I want to go back and give a little historical background on this item. Um, you all looked at in the committee the whole format PUD code changes that were presented about, I think it was six months ago? For about six months ago, and at that time we specifically raised this 20 acre issue and asked that you, you know, um, not hear those PUD code changes because they mirrored the R3 and RTH code changes and kind of absent, absented some of, they had so many bad things in them uh, that we were very concerned about in the development community. And you may remember, you know, we talked about, you know, please let's go ahead with this 20 acre thing because that's really the only thing that I remember and, and Susan Newman may comment, she was, I 
pick on the, the Planning and Zoning Board at that time. That's really the only thing that the Planning and Zoning Board, the development community and staff and yourselves at the time agreed with uh, was going down to the 20 acre PUD as a minimum standard for plan unit developments. And you hit on the reason for that several times in the conversation tonight. There is no availability. I think Charles said, um, um, he, doubt, he doubts that there's any other way. There is no other mixed use, the ability to do mixed use development in the city of Homestead. PUD really is the only mechanism that allows for that. Our plans have not changed for two years. We have the same plan we started with, which was to catalyze some commercial development in the middle of the block on Campbell Drive on a piece of property that's surrounded by 25 units per acre, Section 8 apartment buildings. Uh, we don't want to build that. We want to do something different that has commercial frontage on it. And we've been working on this for two years. Um, so that's why the urgency at this point, um, all we need to move forward with the plans that I think staff likes. Uh, and I, I mean, I think staff really likes the plan. Um, we've, we've even presented, I, I think, a, a, no, a non-specific version to you that you really liked. Uh, and that's really all that we need. So that's why we felt, because, and, and according to staff, there was really no other opportunity to bring this forward and, and, and you know, try and catalyze the process. Um, and we have done a lot of design. We've met with the um, urban design uh, review person from the city of Homestead twice. We've made dramatic modifications. Uh, we're working on a signalized intersection for the site. Um, we really think it's a positive thing. But I, I also, and I understand the vice mayor's concern that she thinks this is something specific for this project. Well, yes, we can't, uh, you know, get where we need to get with without this. Um, but the concept for the, the acreage reduction, um, you know, that stands on its own two feet, regardless of this site. Uh, in the southwest area, if you're going to do mixed-use development, this is the only viable vehicle for that. I believe. Other sites along in, in the city, even the site where we all stand tonight, without this adjustment in the code, uh, no mixed use type of development can be considered here. Um, you know, so, so this is certainly not uh, specifically something for us. What we're saying is if that's the item that we all agree on, let's agree on it and go on and, 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 and keep from hurting us with other changes, possible changes to the PUD code. Now, I was not aware that uh, uh, Amanda's uh, committee, Councilwoman Garner's committee, uh, was prepared to present, uh, I think you said a week from now, um, back when we had this same conversation a long time ago, the mayor said, you know, 30 days, uh, we would have the code back. Well, that's been four months ago. So that's why we're back tonight. Um, you know, yes, we need this for this project, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not, a, 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 you know, specific to this site. It really is important to have the next, um, you know, the next type of development, which I think you all want, is mixed use and, and well-planned development. So that's, uh, that kind of brings us back to, to a point where I think Dick can maybe summarize. Wait, with respect to the timing, what we had hoped is what Charles <coughs> indicated, that the land use plan amendment is being reviewed now. We think that certainly by mid-April or so, maybe by the end of April, <laughs> you'll have that before you for final hearing. And we were hoping that shortly after that, everything else would follow through up to you for final approval. Um, we did not mean at all for this to be adversarial with the staff. We came here with us. Uh, I saw this, by the way, uh, this was recommendation was faxed to me earlier today, and I thought it was an apples and oranges thing because I, you have the ability anyway to put any restrictions on this PUD. But we didn't want this to be adversarial. If you, uh, if you feel comfortable with just allowing this to go forward, and what that does is just to allow the staff to review the PUD, to go through P and Z, and bring it back up to you. If you would just uh, allow this to go forward under the staff recommendation, uh, you would at least allow us to get moving, and when the land use plan amendment comes back to you, the PUD and everything will come, come to you shortly thereafter. And you won't, uh, we won't be in limbo again. So we're asking you, if you would consider, just approving this subject to the staff recommendation. That's what everybody started off talking about. I didn't mean it to get off on a, on a tangent. Mm -hmm. If you can consider that, we'd appreciate it. Mr. Crooker, one more question just to uh, clarify some, some thoughts that I have. 
what is the negative impact for you if this doesn't go forward tonight? In assuming that it gets put into the mix with the other PUD changes, it's just time. It is what has occurred is these, as Tim indicated, these PUD ordinance changes have been discussed for many, many months. And we were sitting back waiting for these things. But there's a lot of pressure on the developer because of the contract that he has with the land sellers. That kind of contractual pressure on two ends by the developer, he had to do something to get it moving. And that's why we applied for the code change, just for the 20 acres. Because these plans have been sitting around for months and months waiting for this code to be modified. So, as Tim indicated, and I think this is absolutely true, there didn't seem to be any dispute at any level, staff, P&Z, and I don't believe it at the council, that lowering the minimum size from 30 to 20 in certain areas would be a good thing and appropriate. So we thought we'd go through and get that issue done so at least we can go forward with the review. Okay. Mr. Porter and then Amanda. Were you finished, Mr. Arnold? Almost. I just wanted to share, you know, I do understand somewhat of a sense of urgency myself. I think government's slow, and I get impatient with it myself sometimes. But I did want to clear that up, and I don't think, I think as a whole, at ULI, everybody has pretty much agreed to the lowering in the size of it. I just wanted to get an understanding of why we had to put this up for it. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that it won't happen anyways. But my thing was, you know, why it was put up for it, and you've cleared that for me. And I'm somewhat comfortable with it. I just didn't want to be put out there as we're doing a special favor for one particular project, and then here comes the floodgates of a lot of other projects coming along asking for the same variance. And me being Mr. Consistent, you know, I want to be able to be consistent, and I need to know why these type of issues come before us so that when it do come again and the next one comes along, then I can be consistent with my decision making. And, you know, I'm comfortable with moving forward today because it's pretty much going forward anyways based on the chair, and the chair of the committee is in agreement with it and wants to move forward. So I'm comfortable with that. I just need to have myself assured of, you know, that we were not playing favorites, so to speak. So I just, and I appreciate your comments and your clarification of that. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Porter, Amanda, and Mr. Lawson. Charles, one of the things that you said that really scares the life out of me is creating a pipeline. You know, we've sat here for years trying to figure if someone was in the pipeline or out of the pipeline or on the front side of the pipe or the back side of the pipe, and I really am very afraid of creating that scenario again. I wholeheartedly support the reduction in the PUD question. I'm 100% opposed to creating a scenario where you have to remember where someone started, where they currently are, and where they need to end up. I'm opposed to that scenario. But, you know, there's only a few questions that I have about the reduction because one of the things that I think in the 50-acre PUD, the percentage, 35% had to be commercial? No, there's no limit on commercial. It's 35% open space, and that's currently a PUD code no matter the size of the PUD. Okay. Well, the only thing that as the tracts of PUD get smaller, hypothetically 20 BN, or if it ends up with these small 5-acre PUDs, you know, I just want to be sure that we need to always have to incorporate a large percentage of that into a commercial component. Which we don't have in code right now, and that was one reason. We 
the staff screen we have an antiquated PUD code um, and there has been no wholesale changes to it since 1975 so it, it, you know it's been our instruction from from this board and from planning and zoning board to look at the PUD code and make changes to it and that's what we are doing um, keep in mind that this development right now this piece of property is not land use for what they want to do with it until the state says that and we're looking in April there's plenty of time to get that code change you know in front of you and and, and work through now you it was it was said that Ms. Garner has the um, this you guys are working on this at, at this time yes and what was the <coughs> approximate timeline when you think you would be able to bring that back um, we feel that that's the latest the calendar 29th of March I mean if we had a special cow we could have it sooner okay because um, that, that's not that far away right okay and, and it's probably I, I'm quite certain it will be done or simultaneous with the time the states completed with their approval or denial of the land use change okay if <laughs> so. if this is if this is approved tonight based on the staff's recommendation will it create a grandfather or will it create a pipeline for this particular well, if, if it's based on staff's recommendation it will not create a pipeline because it will be beholden to the new code and that's what staff's recommendation which is fairly specific that um, our recommendation is only here if we don't go below 20 and that our additional changes are incorporated that we make our additional code changes and this developer is not exempt from those changes is it necessary to do this tonight or is this it would it be more appropriate to wait so that we could see all of the list of changes that would come up in well the <coughs> that would probably be best but the the applicant you know did request this so we put it in front of council and let you make the decision well, my only thing is I can support the changes but I can't support creating a scenario of, of pipeline again because it took us right. a long time to get out of that so we're not out of it yet it, <laughs> That's why thank you for telling me <laughs> I look forward to the next pipeline and it's, meeting and it's, and, it's, and it's a headache for staff and everybody well, else but I can you know I can support it if if your recommendation tonight does not allow any sort of a creation of some sort of confusion on our part to have to remember <coughs> But otherwise, I'm just as comfortable waiting until uh, Ms. Garner comes back with the, the total picture as well. Well, and understand that if you support the change um, and staff's recommendation, we would incorporate the 20 acres into our PUD changes and put that in front of Planning and Zoning Board because it you don't see it until they see it. They see it first and then it will come to you. Uh, you can see it in the community as a whole, but you can't vote on it until Planning and Zoning Board has made their vote because they're a local planning agency. So that's that's the process that it would follow. Well, I'll, I, I just think that the PUD process, even on 20 acres, is far greater. Is You get a far better product than if you have small... Uh, individual developers with no consistency in in their um, in their connectivity, in their style, design, uh, any of the any of the aesthetics that we've been seeing in the PUDs will be greatly diminished if we don't take the standard down to allow some of the smaller tracts of land to do the same similar scenario. I fully agree. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Amanda, and then Mr. Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Porter. You touched on a lot of my concerns, and. First of all, I'm in no hurry to bring this one specific change. I, I really wanted to bring all of the changes together so that when people saw, oh, I can do a 20-acre PUD, these are my requirements. Um, Charles, when is the next planning and zoning meeting? The 16th of March. Okay. I believe that we can have our changes done by then. I would like to meet with you tomorrow and Thursday to try to finish them up so we can send it to the attorneys. Mayor, I would ask that we just go ahead and defer this item until we have um, sent the changes to planning and zoning bring it all together to the planning and zoning on the 16th back to council on the 29th for final approval uh, because as mr porter said if we're creating a pipeline if people think that they can do a 20 acre pud and they don't know the rules yet either it's going to get very hairy and the reason we were doing this was for the applicant but now this has become 
quite a problem. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second the motion. Second by Mr. Ford. Mr. Lausner? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I've got great concerns about the pipeline because a lot of good legislation has been effectively undone by those in the pipeline and those claiming a scenario of vested rights. And I think there's only two, I agree, there's only two ways, I think, to avoid the pipeline. Either adopt the recommendation of staff tonight that, that we begin to move this forward subject to adopting the regulations or just uh, adopt it as a package at such time as we see the, uh, the regulations. And it seems the conversation has come full circle because I expressed in my earlier comments my concern, and I agree, PUDs give us far more input, I won't say control, input as to design. But when we start getting down to 20 acres, and I tried to scratch out some math here that in effect, under this particular scenario, we would have upwards of 30 units per acre. And I heard tonight that, well, we talked about a 20-acre PUD earlier, but we didn't want to be subjected to the R3 guidelines. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this council has been firm that we don't, didn't for a long time allow R3, and if you're going to have R3, you're going to have some stringent guidelines. So I don't want to put us in a situation where we are loosening the knot on our, our very forethinking R3 guidelines by adopting this tonight without having anything in, uh, in place. So let's either, you know, I, Charles, correct me, if, if we, Without the, forgetting for a minute, there's a motion to defer. But if we, if we adopted your recommendations tonight, it would merely allow you to accept for filing the application, and only taking it so far, pending, pending the, pending not only state approval, but the adoption of regulations here. It doesn't vest any approval rights in this applicant or anybody who may come in behind them. I believe you might want to ask that to one of our attorneys. <laughs> no, I think we've got two of them here. <laughs> when do you guys make room for James? Yeah. <laughs> Not you, Charles. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I can state for the record with respect to the client that I represent that we would stipulate that this creates no vested rights. It, it creates no pipeline effect, and we have no rights other than to process plans. Uh, that's that, that's what I can do for my client. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, if I might, um, what's before you would not create any vested rights um, or the pipeline because currently it's not allowed. Simply, there is no 20-acre PUD, so there's nothing that this applicant or any applicant could be vested on. It simply would be what's already allowed in code. Um, you can either follow the recommendation of staff tonight or wait until the full changes come before you. Either way, um, there would be no vesting by an applicant until if this council so chose to adopt the 20 acre minimum along with whatever future recommendations for the PUD might be added to that. So right now as it stands there's nothing for them to rest on except for what's already existing in code. The other thing is that in terms of practicality maybe the, the acting clerk or Patty, whatever, I'm not sure what your title is at this moment, can help us, but this is an ordinance change. But all you're doing, this is a committee of the whole meeting, so in order for this to become effective there would have there has to be two readings of this ordinance. Um, do you think it's a, it's a Wait, 14, so, so day, fourteen days in between the readings? I don't. Fourteen days and then notice requirements, right? So between first You're and second reading. The oh, earliest this could be adopted as code language. I'm saying is your second meeting in March. March at the earliest, and I don't think you can get it on the agenda for Monday night because I don't think there's been any. Uh, it, it still has to go to the LPA. This would still have to go to P and Z as the, the LPA. So when's the earliest this could be adopted if they approved it tonight? Probably late April, huh? Late April. So what's the point? Why not wait? If, if, if we Mr. Mayor, it'd be the same track if we're in a perfect world. If if everything goes to the P and Z on the 16th, this would have normally gone to P and Z on the 16th. It would be the same track if the, if the code if amendments advertise that Ms. Gardner is uh, proposing 
F9. Uh, I'm sorry. We have a tie. So P and Z on the same ones that we were talking about four months ago. First reading of council on the 18th. And then second reading of council on May. And that's conservative. We brought what we thought was the first and second reading. We didn't know that these things were were close enough to be processed. Okay. Good. Yeah, Vice Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to miss, I want, to, I want us to go back to the original point, um, the, the pipeline not being an issue, and I wasn't concerned about the pipeline being an issue because there is absolutely, absolutely no right to a 20-acre to, to pud. My concern is, sure? and we're uh, acknowledging that we have a motion on the floor to defer, I think, it, I think that's good, but I think it might be better just to vote it hopefully vote it down because what you have here is you have a you, you have something that's before us that not, not only will, will be an effectual code change but you have a special exception for this one particular um, applicant you have a special exception because he wants this actual change without the exceptions that would be required with the change I think we should just vote it down because if, if the fact is a deferment would bring this back before us I'd rather not have this come back before us because he wants this this would be passed, but it would be without without the accepted code changes that are going to be required in order to get a 20 acre pipe. We're going to pull. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. You, you follow my my line of thinking. Mm -hmm. well, well, I think staff but, but, but if you so vote it down, staff recommendation is that if to we include to include the, the new changes, the new changes. Ex exactly. Yeah. That, right. Okay. I, I, think I think Mr. Kogut agreed that they will in whatever changes that we recommend that they will. So, we'll so have to embrace. by deferring this, it's not going to effectuate whatsoever this particular petition. Yeah. Just, Mr. Mayor? This petition really can't go forward because there's no land use change for them to go forward on. Their P doesn't work with the current future, under the future land use designation. They right. can't move forward until we get that approved back from state and that's adopted. Right. Um, that's so they're s stuck where they are at this point until that change is implemented. Um, my point about just voting it up or down. Yes. Well, I think we can make it easy no, for you. No, let's make it easy. We're going to defer it. No. And then we'll make it easier than that. that. Thank you. I appreciate that thought, but we're going to make it easier than that. We'll just withdraw our application. Yeah. How about that? But I, but I want to make a few comments also. The reason for that withdrawal is the whole purpose of this application is we went through DRC and everything. The whole purpose was to. Uh, to bring a non-controversial amendment to you to allow us to go forward with the process of pending the land use plan amendment. If, in fact, the entire ordinance that you've been working on for quite some time is at a point where you can start processing it now, then the timing would be the same. And we're, we're happy to be in there uh, with the other code changes. We'll probably address it because we have some discussions. But uh, we're happy to be there. As long as it's being moved forward, that's all we we're trying to do. Good. Thank Mayor. you. Uh, if, I, if I could, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Please. Miles, I did your tip. Sure. Oh. Fellow council members, before we applaud the withdrawal, we need to remember comments that were made. Assuming the underlying land use change comes back from the state, as a matter of right, they can come back and build 10 units to the acre on 20 acres, and so long as they meet current code, there's no enhancement. And with the opportunity of the PUD designation, there can be enhancement. So I guess an effect is that it would be all residential if it's not PUD? No, in is fact, the, um, the master plan uh, changes that were set up for the state addressing this particular piece of property um, were for uh, about 60%, 60 to 70% of the property to be residential mm -hmm. and uh, the rest, the remainder of the parcel will be uh, commercial. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that has never changed. That's always been our intention with the property. And the density, uh, if you're interested, I heard some numbers uh, mentioned it'd be between 12 and 14 units per acre net density on the residential component period so but I could I finish with what I was going to say 
Um, if you quit, I'm I'm no, I'm not going to have the luxury of remaining involved in this project because I'm I'm moving my business operations to North Florida, and um, I'm leaving leaving Homestead. My family's already moved and is up there. I just want to caution you because I'm I'm probably not going to be able to be remain engaged in 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 this process and the discussion of the PD code changes. I just want to go back briefly over the timeline. We were about four to six months behind on the application going to the state of Florida for the land use change. And then, you know, we've been dealing with this PD code change stuff for f at least four, if not six months. We've been working on this project for two years. Um, you know, it's not just a benefit to this project. It's a benefit to a lot of other areas in town. But I'm very concerned, and I've shared this with some of the members of the Planning and Zoning Board at many of the meetings that we've had. Um, there's been tremendous upward movement in the market. There's been, there have been new products offered for the city of Homestead that I never dreamed would be built and sold in Homestead at great prices. Uh, but there's a limit to what the market will accept. And, and I just want to remind all of you, as you look at these code changes, um, you know, if this were Ocean Reef, you could build a little car house, just like your little house that you're going to live in, and you could sell it for a million dollars all day long. This, you know, we're talking about areas of the city that are going to be developed under my, what I see the new code being, uh, you know, for PUDs allowed on smaller parcels, infill development. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, you know, beautiful, um, large-scale communities that that are going to have houses at $400,000 price tags. We're talking about infill development around areas that are considered blighted. Uh, so, you know, when you look at the code changes, please consider that and keep that in mind because you can't build a 120 or 140 or even a maybe $150,000 unit that has a balcony, a covered garage, you know, increased setback requirements, um, 80 square feet of storage. You know, you just can't accomplish all of that and deliver a marketable product. So that's that's my concern as you look at code changes. And uh, thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, Tim. Mr. Larson, you want it? Uh, no, I guess if they've withdrawn of record, we don't need to address the motion on the floor. Don't need to. We need to withdraw. Well, the vice mayor, uh, who made the motion to defer? You I did. did. She did not second it. Uh -huh. I, I withdraw my second. It would be my suggestion that we go ahead and pursue the development of of guidelines governing PUDs of, tw of uh, 20 to 50 acres. 20, yeah. We'll look forward to uh, some discussion at the PNZ board on the 16th. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All righty, on item four, transportation and transit master plan task number one. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, it's staff recommendation that Council approve task number one of the transportation and transit master plan and submitted by BNA, the people who have been selected to uh, work on our traffic plan. Uh, early work by BNA has been on mainly in our areas of uh, most development, uh, where again things are moving pretty fast and furious. Uh, at this point, they're ready to take on task number one of a citywide taking a view of the whole city and putting together the transportation plan for the whole city. And this particular request is to approve task number one of our, uh, of our proposal. And there's five tasks altogether to complete the project, but uh, we're asking right now to move forward with task number one. Is there a motion for approval? Move recommendation with question. Moved by Councilman Porter, second by Vice Mayor Bell. Question? Uh, Mr. Mr. Manager, um, they, will, they will be coordinating with the efforts that are currently being done by the county as far as the, the half-cent transportation plan is concerned? Yes. Because I know it, it appeared that there was somewhat of a surprise of some of the issues that the the transportation uh, system that was being put in it was a surprise to me I know and some of the other community and about um, the connectivity with buses that we were I thought we were at some point in time going to create that recreate that same connectivity that may already be existing mean, mainly from at this particular point from the villages of homestead over to the community college and I know we were t looking at a system to, to accomplish that same thing so I just want to make sure that we incorporate county plans as well as sure. city plans. Thank you, Mayor. What's the time frame on completing um, the first task? I don't have that. Julian, do you know the time frame for the first uh, session? 
Yeah, this task will, will probably take uh, about a month or two, no longer than that. Um, they are working concurrently on other tasks as well. Uh, we expect in approximately six months to have the whole master plan completed. So that's what we're looking at. The agreement, the agreement before you provides that it must be done in not more than 60 days. And you, 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 you indicated task one and task two. How many total tasks will this involve? And at what projected cost overall? There are five total tasks, uh, one of them being uh, what they're doing right now, which is working with uh, development services in terms of uh, new developments. Uh, that's what they're pretty much put all their efforts into until now. Uh, the projected total cost um, is budgeted at around $200,000, 210 to be exact. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? On the Finance Committee items, communication monitoring equipment for the SCADA, SCADA system. SCADA system, uh, Mayor and Council, again, it's, uh, we've put out uh, interest in this, providing this equipment, and we had two respondents, and it was, uh, evaluation committee was put together, and it was a committee's recommendation uh, that the bid be awarded to overall lowest and most responsive, uh, responsible bidder, meeting the specifications, and that was uh, Utilicor uh, on their bid prices, which uh, were attached the, in the back here. So, uh, again, this, uh, Installing, uh, I guess, SCADA, we always use that, and I always wonder, can't re never remember what the acronym stands for, but it's a Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System. And then we also, uh, as part of that, an automatic generation control uh, to, again, all designed to optimize the uh, operation of the electrical system. We're just upgrading and modernizing our capabilities there. Is there a motion for approval? Motion. Motion by Councilman Hodge is a second. Second. Question. Is, is this in the transportation transportation lines? I'm sorry. Is this in the transportation lines or is it in the? I'm it's, just it's in the uh, monitoring and control equipment mainly, but uh, it's transferring. I don't have the, the electric utility person here, but it's transferring information. You got communications equipment that comes back to a central like point that provides information on the operation of the system. But it's not in the generation side, it's in no. the transportation well, overhead Well, side. actually it does impact the generation. It may tell engines, you know, okay. where you need to power up okay. and less power. Right, does, thank, uh, you. thank you, Mayor. On the, um, on the bid side, is this by coincidence, we budget 105 and the bid came out to 105, how does it work? That was, uh, again, Brian, you want to comment on that? But it's basically um, what the low bidder was on their money. We didn't know exactly what this was going to be, but okay. it was part of uh, money that we had set aside, not knowing exactly what uh, the price of that equipment would be. So it's budgeted for. So they, the, uh, we have any, money budgeted any for bidder that. Would, any bidder has access to yeah. our budget. Well, they would. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be true, but it, it's also we've budgeted money for it, and, and we've matched the money to the to the bid. I got it. Any other questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Yes. Purchase and installation of security equipment resolution. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, on this one, I uh, need to recuse myself. I, ha I have the appearance of a conflict here with the companies involved, and Julio and Brian will present this uh, particular item. I think for the record, Kurt, you should state that, that uh, Kurt has, has totally stayed away from this procurement, has had no involvement in this procurement. Correct. That's correct. Why don't you state that? Yeah, I, I guess for the record, stating that I have not been involved in the procurement of the, any of this uh, particular equipment or the discussion of it. So, and no, I have had no recommendation to, uh, put forward on this item. Mike? Mr. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, <laughs> I will start and then Brian Holder can help me. This is a grant we received from, uh, through the Homeland Security, uh, totaling $58,000. We're planning to spend $43,000 on this bid. It's sole source. Uh, it's uh, 
It's a, a unique technology. We are utilizing this technology in other locations around the city. And uh, the Public Works is planning to uh, add security enhancements to the locations listed. And I just, for the audience and people who are listening, these are not the only locations that have the security. This is additional security to the other locations that already have security around them for the water and electric utilities. Uh, this is the portion of the grant that we're, uh, we're requesting right now, $43,000 and some change. Uh, and then the city, uh, under the direction of city manager, uh, uh, order us, uh, I mean, uh, instructed us to look at uh, uh, security systems to uh, for uh, other uh, uses at the, at the city. Uh, that's probably uh, for the police department, uh, water, electric, uh, to to practically have a very good system. Uh, uh, purchasing uh, public works, ITS, and I think the police department look at this technology and they think this is really the best for the use. So therefore, we're recommending the approval. Moved oh, by the vice mayor, second by Councilman Porter. Is this Homeland Security grant part of that, those millions of dollars that Miami-Dade County received or just came directly from the um, federal government? No, this is not, uh, this is actually part of the FDLE. It was through the FDLE. I got you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Mr. 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 I noticed that we've already, we are already using this technology at other locations. And I was a little bit concerned that, you know, if, if you know, and obviously it's a good thing to have a comprehensive system without a lot of patchwork in it. But I'm wondering how and when this was specced out that we ended up with a system that only one company can produce. I guess so. Mr. Lawson, mem members of council, we were looking at this from also the aspect with the substations um, due to the fact that it is a, the unit doesn't require underground work uh, as far as invasive underground work to the locations. They are literally wireless as they would you put it with no electrical running to them because they are self-sustaining they have the solar power capability all those things were considered when we were looking at this unit so in the event of a power failure you don't lose um, the site as well so there's many benefits to it we and we are using it at other facilities for those reasons as well and it also is open architecture as well um, you can practically plug in any other system into this we have a, a other systems right now that are locked up and we cannot use any other type of integrated system keypads or anything this allows for us to use other act, uh, security devices that will plug into it so those are the benefits that we were looking at using for this thank you thank you any other questions all in favor say aye aye opposed Park and Red, Councilwoman Woolman. Oops. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I first of all, I want to apologize because I thought this was going to be a short meeting, and that's why, that's why we chose tonight to uh, to bring this forward. About three years ago, three and a half years ago, mm -hmm. losing my audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bye, guys. Um, about three and a half years ago, at one of our tourism meetings, we talked about having. Um, a marathon from one national park to the another national park and then as I thought about it a little bit I thought well you know what why not have a trail from one park to the next park you know re bringing it through downtown homestead bringing and en encompassing it with the bike path the new um, uh, not bike path busway <laughs> I got bikes on the brain and anyway we've been sitting around a table at Fred for about a year and over a year now yeah, yeah, over a year now, and just ha ha just going over every detail. And I'm so thrilled to tell you that uh, tonight we are going to give you a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, this will be a collaborative effort involving multiple agencies, including the National Park Service, the State of Florida, Miami-Dade County, South Florida Water Management District, the City of Florida City, and the City of Homestead. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Fred Hurling of the National Park Service, who will be making the presentation on behalf of the agencies, and then we'll discuss it a little bit afterwards. Everybody's left. Thank you. Oh. 
Well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here and talk to you about a project that we think is a uh, will be a great community asset to the city of Homestead and all of South Miami-Dade County. And I have two handouts here that I'm going to provide to you all. Um, the first one is a, uh, a copy of the presentation itself, for just for your record, and if you want to take notes or just... Uh, jot some ideas down after the meeting and we, we would uh, appreciate your feedback on what we're going to talk about this evening. And the other handout, which um, we don't have enough copies for everybody, but um, we'll at least pass them out and they can get as far as, um, as they go and then we can always get additional copies, is a, uh, a brochure about the city of, Homes uh, city of Homestead and its connection to uh, bicycling in America. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And um, I see a few faces looking at me like, I haven't heard of that before. Well, it's news to a lot of people, and we're going to talk about how that links into this project here in 2005. As Congresswoman, uh, Councilwoman Waldman mentioned earlier, yeah, Councilwoman Waldman mentioned, a lot of us have been working on this project for, an, for a long time, and um, a lot of folks from the city of Homestead, their staffs have been really integral to getting us off the ground and really getting this project moving forward. In addition, in addition, there's other folks from the community that have been involved and some folks from the National Park Service, both um, Superintendent Linda Canzanelli from Biscayne, and uh, who's sitting back here. And this is probably one of her last meetings in the, in the area as she's been promoted and moving on to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania uh, in, in a few, few weeks. And uh, Acting Superintendent uh, Dan Kimball from Everglades. And both uh, superintendents have made this project a real priority um, for the National Park Service here in South, uh, South Florida. And I also want to introduce Mary Collier, who is here from Cumberland Gap uh, National Recreation Area in Kentucky, who is going to be acting in Linda's behalf for the next uh, four months or so. And um, we want to welcome her to the community as well. And working the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation projector here is uh, Michelle Omekin, who's a community outreach specialist with Biscayne National Park and who has been helping me and uh, it's been a real team effort to get this idea moving forward and we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you for a few moments tonight. Um, as this first slide talks about, it, this is a, a, a community project involving many stakeholders and the key, the key vision that we've talked about is really a, a, a project that connects both national parks, Biscayne to the east and Everglades to the west and ideally it really captures the idea of, of the park, the parks and the, and, the, and the land connections between them, both from Homestead, Florida City and, and the Redlands, but also a water connection because that is so integral to South Florida. So it's a, a land-based greenway, but it also connects Biscayne and Florida Bays, two natural features that are really uh, world-renowned and, and, and a key feature of this project. Uh, this evening I just want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, the project. We're going to familiarize you with the project if you're not already up to speed on what the Greenway is and what this particular project is about. We're going to talk about a formal uh, request that we want the City of Homestead to, to support this project as we move forward and get, get things rolling because time is of the essence as we just heard this last presentation about development in the city. We know that land is being uh, used up quite rapidly and this project really is a way to a thread to connect communities and make for a higher quality of life for the residents of, of Homestead and, and the surrounding area. And then lastly, we want to just mention that the, the reason that we need uh, to talk to you all, in addition to getting formal support, is to initiate a planning process that we think will take about six to nine months that will come up with a feasibility study that identifies how likely is it that this project can be completed and what is the best way to move forward with that. And then a concept plan which would identify uh, through a public involvement process uh, the best attributes that we should bring forward to capture the quality of life, the, the community assets that are here in South Miami-Dade County and move forward with this project, um, hopefully with a, with a groundbreaking and a, and a first phase uh, sometime next year. Um, as I mentioned, the, the idea is not only a, a land-based connection between uh, Biscayne National Park and, and Everglades, but also a way to uh, connect the natural features of both uh, Biscayne Bay and Florida Bay. Um, the dashed line you see up there um, from Biscayne Bay to the headquarters of Everglades National Park has been the main corridor of focus for, for the group that's been working on this effort. And we've identified about a one mile wide 
uh, stretch of, of land that goes from east to west, uh, weaving through Homestead, Florida City, and in unincorporated areas of the county, there will be the area of study uh, as to where this final Greenway Trail would actually go. No decisions have been made yet. We want to um, have expertise talk about the, the qualities we're looking for and get public involvement on identifying the pros and cons of various ways to connect the, uh, these communities and these parks together. And then ultimately, the goal would be to go from not only from Everglades National Park headquarters, but take the trail all the way down to Flamingo. So we would have not only about a 25-mile uh, land-based project from Biscayne to Everglades headquarters, but then take it another 40 miles down to Flamingo and link to other transportation options and really make it a, a true destination um, in and of itself. So that's, that's the vision. Um, Okay, we go ahead and talk about that. Um, Michelle, you can just put up, there's I think four or five bullet points here about just a quick history of the project. I think there might be one more. Great. Okay, um, as I mentioned earlier about bikeways, well, in 1961, uh, the city of Homestead, Florida, believe it or not, was identified and recognized as the first biking city in America. So we have a 40 year plus history of, of a formal bicycle recognition, and, and the focus of that bikeway system was safety and secure ways of, of recreating um, in your community. And here we are, you know, 40, 44 years later, talking about an idea that, that was established then, and um, right now we have a much bigger vision of what that could be. And we think the principles of that, of that bikeway in 1961, which is, is, was handed out earlier, uh, applies in many ways to what we're talking about today. May West was here for the opening uh, and launching of that bikeway, so it has a lot of historical connections, and you'll see some interesting photos in that brochure. Um, more recently, the idea of bicycling and greenways. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. Kind of, uh... <laughs> oh, come up, yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I know it was a big deal in 1961 when she was <laughs> performing in Miami. It was a, a great, a great coup for the city of Homestead to come and, uh, and have her come down and, and launch the, uh, the bikeway project. But bringing things more current, um, after Hurricane Andrew, the county initiated a major uh, planning effort and established a, a South Miami-Dade County Greenway Network. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But that really um, was launched after Hurricane Andrew, and that plan was completed in 1994. And key pieces of that are being implemented today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Councilwoman Waldman, this has been a, a real passion, I know, for you and, and your tourism committee, and I think uh, the energy that you've brought and the uh, staff at the City of Homestead and others have brought to the table in the past uh, number of months has really um, created great interest in the community and, and great level of support. And I know no one has said this, this, is, this has been thought of as a bad idea. I mean, everybody is really supportive of this, and we think what we uh, have to say tonight will uh, get more folks interested and hopefully get involved in the planning process uh, as we move forward. Um, both national parks, Biscayne and Everglades, um, are in the midst of their 20-year management plan revisions, and that's a major undertaking that each national park um, uh, has with the community, and, and public input, input and involvement in that process has identified that there are important things we need to do inside our park boundaries, but more importantly, or equally as important, the connections to the communities outside the park. And we think this project is a great vehicle to do that, uh, serve that purpose, and make the parks part of the community and the community part of the parks. Uh, they're all one and the same. And then lastly, uh, where this idea really got triggered uh, was back in July of 2004 um, at our office up at 10th and Chrome. Uh, we hosted a, uh, what was part of a national broadcast of gateway communities across the United States, about uh, 60 different sites uh, across the country that, were, that are near national parks or national forests, linked up by satellite and heard from uh, a panel of, of national experts on how parks and communities can work better together and how economics and ecology really fit hand in hand if you do it the right way and how we can make communities more prosperous and uh, take better advantage of uh, being next to national parks, but also, um, encouraging local residents who may not be familiar with, with why the parks exist or, or how they are linked to natural and historical and, and unique attributes of the area that they're, they're found in, how they really can uh, strengthen the connection they have to uh, great open spaces that are right in their backyard. Um, so back in July, we, we got together 
uh, the meeting here at Homestead actually had the largest attendance of any of these 60 national hookups across the country. There was great interest from government, private sector, you name it, uh, key leadership in, in, in local um, South Miami-Dade County was there. And it was a great, great meeting and launched this idea of a, uh, of a project like this Greenway. Um, again, just the 1994 plan, which was called the South Dade Greenway Network, identified a series of trails and open space areas from, from Kendall down to the Kendall Drive down to um, the Monroe County line that would connect uh, a variety of trails together and, and, and provide yeah. paved and unpaved surfaces, uh, open space, various amenities that would really link um, recreation uh, uh, and close to home opportunities to the people that live down here. And this is a, a not very good map that, uh, in terms of how you could see what's on there, but there are about 10 different trails composed of about 200 miles in length that, that weave uh, through South Miami-Dade County. And, th and this project, uh, back in the 1994 plan, was called the Everglades Trail. Uh, we think of it more as a community-based trail now and uh, have talked to the county about tweaking the alignment of it to meet the needs that, that now exist here in uh, 2005. And they're, they're on board with that and they've been very supportive in terms of technical assistance and likely financial support to develop this project as we move forward. So this shows that network of about 10 trails in, in South Miami-Dade County, this being one of the key ones. Um, again, we've had about uh, four meetings in late 2004 where we've had over 20 different organizations and individuals come to the table and, and pledge their support with either technical assistance, uh, financial support, and other resources to make this a go, everywhere from the city of Homestead in Florida City to the, uh, the Farm Bureau, uh, FP&L, uh, environmental groups, um, uh, the National Park Service, both parks, and our, 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 our rivers and trails experts uh, out of the Sarasota, Florida office are all on board. Uh, South, South Dade uh, uh, community groups are all across, are really uh, on board with this project. Uh, the Water Management District is pledged to help out either through uh, donating easements adjacent to their canals or in other ways to make, make this project a reality. Um, the county, the state of Florida, all are on board. Uh, just a, a broad base of, of interest groups uh, uh, coming to the table to talk about uh, the value of this project and, and pledging their support. Greenways, as we've talked about earlier, are really just a linear park that connects many local uh, community-based assets, whether they're natural, cultural, agricultural uh, businesses such as those in Homestead and Florida City. It's a, it's a way to link people and places together and make, make the community a more vital and more vibrant place to live and work. Um, the quality of life will certainly be enhanced with a project such as this. They provide that close to home recreation that promotes healthier lifestyles and really gets people to know their neighbors, to know what's going on uh, in their communities. Uh, oftentimes that's not the case. Uh, we go from air conditioned cars to our offices back to home. This is a way to really entice people to be more a part of the community and uh, we think enhance economic prosperity in the area as well. Uh, this, this, uh, this slide talks about a study that was done by the National Association of Realtors a couple years back and they asked people in a survey what were the qualities that people look for when they look, look to relocate or move to a new area or buy a new home. And by, by and large the, the great attributes that people look for were walking and bike paths uh, and parks and open space. Um, much further down the list were active recreation areas such as soccer fields or, or, or living adjacent to golf courses. It was really getting out of your home and getting on a trail, get, going to a park and you know, playing with your family, uh, meeting your neighbors and, 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 and seeing people in a different light. The, um, the economics of, of, of recreation and tourism is, is just enormous. Uh, in, in 2003, $70 billion in this country was spent uh, related to outdoor recreation pursuits. Um, and over one million jobs. Uh, just, just a huge amount of, of financial opportunity exists here in, in South Miami-Dade County to capitalize on that. Um, a study a couple years back in North Carolina talked about how their bike system on the Outer Banks um, attracted over, almost 700,000 tourists and generated about $60 million in revenue for the local economy there. So, you know, as, as we he are here in South Florida next to two national parks, um, the opportunities are tremendous. Three, th three million people a year pass right by here on their way to the Florida Keys. Why can't this place be more of a destination where people stop, 
enjoy the resources, enjoy the, the unique opportunities of, of how this area was created over the last century, and really begin to learn and appreciate more of what happens here in, in South Miami-Dade County and, and the national parks. Uh, uh, just some statistics on, on the state of Florida. 60, 76 million tourists come here each year, and that number is growing. Again, more than 5 million come to Miami-Dade County and the Keys. Um, the revenues just you know, skyrocketing, 51 billion and growing. Um, right here, on, on both ends of this greenway, we have two unique national parks. One, the largest protected marine park in the national park system. The other, the largest subtropical wilderness in the entire national park system. Um, much to do and appreciate and learn about here in uh, our backyards. Um, as I mentioned, the group has met for about four months, uh, from August through December of, of, of 2004. And here's a draft mission statement, which I'll just quickly read to you all. Um, the Biscayne Bay to Florida Bay Greenway links uh, the two national parks. And it's a multi-purpose trail system that connects the natural, cultural, and historical assets of Miami-Dade County. It enhances the quality of life for residents and also offers a unique transportation alternative for national and international visitors to come and experience the area. So people, whether they come and fly to Miami International Airport or Fort Lauderdale, can come down here. They don't have to rent a car. They can get on, um, rent a bicycle, get on a, a transit system that takes people from, from Miami-Dade County down to this area, um, connects to the parks. Just a whole range of opportunities that, that we're pursuing that would make this a reality. Um, some key goals that the group has established so far. Um, as I've mentioned, it's an important connection between the national parks and the community. It also allows the quality of life to be enhanced for people that live here now and those that are moving here uh, fast and furiously. Um, it's a great way to expand local tourism and economic strengths of the area, both in increasing the number of visitors that come here, but also having them stay here longer and spend more money and, and come to appreciate what's here more than just passing through to get a meal or buy some gasoline or uh, uh, have a, a very quick stop. It could be a, an in-depth in -depth experience for folks traveling down here. Um, I mentioned the transportation links that connect to community assets and amenities, such as the businesses of downtown Homestead. Um, you know, with, with a new busway system coming down, uh, the intermodal center coming down this way, a new city hall perhaps downtown, great opportunities to get people that live in the area or that live further up to the north to come and spend some time at the local businesses. Um, really appreciate the area and what it has to offer. Connections to the agricultural community and the heritage that was been a key part of what's uh, happened here over the last century or more. Um, great opportunities along the way. We've looked at some funding sources, and there are many at the federal, state levels. Um, some are for acquisition and development, in terms of acquisition of lands that would be needed and development of facilities and infrastructure. Um, and there's uh, three mentioned there on the left uh, side column. There's also many more that are available for development of facilities and amenities um, at the federal, state, and, um, and private sector levels. So we've, begin to be, we've begun to gather that information, and believe me, people at the state and federal level are eager to provide us with money if we can get a good, clear plan together on what this Greenway would look like and how we have a plan of attack to move forward in a, in a community-based partnership way. There are lots of opportunities out there to fund this effort if we can define the project and what we want to accomplish. Um, other information we've begun to gather focuses on the management options. You know, the easy part in many ways is just to say the trail is going to go here and build it. The, uh, the more challenging uh, key to success, and probably in the long run, the much more expensive and, and important factor is how do you maintain, manage, and operate this trail system. And we've begun to gather uh, information from across the country on success stories and failures elsewhere and try to learn from that as we move forward. And there's uh, five different models that have been identified. Um, everything from a, a, a truly public entity that manages this to something that's uh, a purely private entity um, that manages uh, their greenway system and everything in between. But there are numerous success stories and, and lessons to be learned about how to pursue this, and we are gathering that information as well. Um, why develop the greenway? Well, I've talked about a lot of those key characteristics. Uh, uh, they're popular, and at the federal and state level, as I mentioned, the state of Florida Department of Environmental Protection has said this project could be the, the fourth major greenway in the state of Florida uh, if we begin this planning effort and begin to line up how this project would be implemented. Uh, they're ready to support this effort in a major way. And again, local leaders and residents that we've been meeting with over the last few months have, have talked glowingly about 
what a, what a great asset this would be to uh, South Miami-Dade County. Um, there were a couple of other uh, characteristics related to the, the heritage and the history of the area, and this trail being um, a key way to bring history and, and, and the currency of what's going on here together and educate and communicate those ideas to, to folks moving forward. Um, key next steps. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're here to uh, explain the project to you, gain your formal support, and ask for a bit of seed money to move forward with the project. Um, we would then develop the plan um, that would look at these various characteristics, such as what are the best route options for this greenway, uh, the ownership acquisition issues, uh, if there are any, uh, construction costs, uh, operational requirements, uh, what kind of facilities would be needed, how do we market this trail and, and greenway, and then long-term funding and management solutions. Those will be components of, the, of this plan that we would uh, like to begin as soon as possible. We see the plan taking shape in a true partnership way with the federal, state, local governments, and equally as important, the private sector and area residents to, to be contributing members to this stakeholder committee that we've begun to uh, pull together. And we would also look to hire a consultant with expertise in this area to kind of bring everybody together and facilitate us uh, along. Uh, the National Park Service Rivers and Trails Program has also pledged to make this a priority project for the southeast region of the National Park Service, and they'll be providing assistance as well. And here are a handful of tasks that we would, would move to, 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 uh, to get the plan uh, in place. And some of those we've already accomplished, such as conducting the research and, and gathering examples, which I just spoke of, uh, and other key characteristics of how we manage greenways. Uh, we look to soon have public workshops and meetings to get feedback from people. What do they want? What, what don't they like? What are, what are the key areas that would, that would shape and make this project unique to South Miami-Dade County and Homestead? Uh, develop the plan uh, uh, and draft plan that would then go out for public review and comment and then finalize it uh, in a feasibility concept plan. And we hope in six to nine months, once we get started, that would be uh, a realistic uh, goal. Uh, following that, we would then begin to identify a first phase of development of where this trail would begin uh, in an initial success story and coordinate that groundbreaking with uh, recognition that the Greenway plan was complete and, re and ready to lay that vision uh, for the Greenway of, of uh, connecting Biscayne and Everglades National Parks. Next. Um, getting started, we've had, our, we've had a series of stakeholder meetings. Uh, we continually welcome new participants and hope to have a, a new one uh, following a series of meetings like this in March that we're having with the county and Florida City and others. Um, get, that key input, get that key input from stakeholders and continue to gather information. So that's what we're working on right now uh, in March 2005. Um, what's needed? Um, the support is critical. Obviously we have lots of people and organizations saying this is a great idea, let's do it. But we really believe that uh, coming to the local governments and getting their support and endorsement of this idea to be pursued is critical at this point in time. And that's one reason we're here tonight. The other piece is to really um, look to several organizations to put together $30,000 $30, that would be needed to hire the consultant and develop this plan over the next six to nine months. And $30,000 plus the technical assistance that the National Park Service Rivers and Trails Program will be providing is, is, is more than sufficient to do the plan successfully and on time. Um, the 30,000, we're, we're looking at it in, in, in three pieces. One is 15,000 from Miami-Dade County, a second uh, 10,000 from the city of Homestead, and 5,000 from the city of Florida City. And those will all be uh, done in, in, in this month, starting tonight. Um, then we would look to hire the consultant, and we would ask if, if Homestead would uh, be favorable to assisting us with the contracting of that consultant to come on board and, and help facilitate that contracting work uh, for this Greenway project. And then once the, the monies are secured, we would have a uh, kick off the project planning effort uh, as soon as possible. I want to thank you for your time and listening. And uh, if you have any questions or want to discuss this, uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. So now you see what we've been doing for the last year. 
Um, is Ruth Campbell still? Ruth, you're still here. Ruth, it, uh, it, am I? Um, is it okay for me to say that that uh, would you like to come forward and talk about the uh, gift from the bicycle museum by the bicycle museum? That's yes. And as Ruth comes forward, I just want to say that Homestead is going to be the one to benefit the most from this besides the parks. So it's with that that um, I think that's something that we really need to pursue. The money's there. The federal money's there. Everything's there. We just have to have a feasibility study before we can go to them. And Ruth, I just wanted you to make that announcement. Can you can you hear Ruth? No. All right. Ruth Campbell, 24 Northeast 12th Street, Homestead, Florida. We uh, have been dreaming about a in connection with a greenway because they're they're around. But we wanted to have, and we have, by the way, we have some money. We have $200,000 that we want to put into this project. Hopefully, cool. to have it be where it could be uh, an information center and uh, a rest stop. A, a, a bicycle museum. Yeah, and then with a museum. Yes. Yes. That, that could be part of it. Yes. And, and, we're gonna and we have... We don't lack for things to put in the museum. <laughs> and Ruth, of course, is. But it. Uh, but we need to do it. I, I'm hoping it would be in Homestead. Yes. Well, our, I think our initial plans, as we sat around the table, was to put it right downtown, um, where the uh, busway, the the main hub, is going to be. Rick, we talked about that. Do you remember? Yes. Hopefully, so, we that's can, our, that's well, our Hopefully, goal. we could attract a bicycle shop. <laughs> we need one in Homestead. Well, anyway. I think the economic impact that's, that, that we can see here, I mean, this is amazing to have this kind of project. And I want to give a lot of thanks out because Charles and Rick and our Parks and Recs with Kurt and John and Marlene and just everyone, Julio, I mean, everybody's been to the table, all the manager staff. We've all been at that table. We've all sat and we've, we've studied and we've worked and we've, we've tried to strategize. And Homestead will be the one to benefit because Homestead will be the one that, where the main center of attention will be. And um, some of these parks, and pa uh, I call it park pathway, it's, there, some of it will even be as much as 100 feet wide. So it's, it's going to be fabulous, absolutely fabulous. And um, Ruth, I want to thank you for that generous contribution because it was you that did that. And, and that's going to be something that we're going to need. But before we can have any of this, we have yeah. to have a feasibility study. And because Homestead is going to be impacted greatly, I'm asking council to approve $10,000 um, for this, and we have meetings set up with Commissioner Moss and Commissioner Sorensen and um, Mayor Wallace this month to ask them to contribute as well. Thank you, Councilman Woolman, and let me thank you for your leadership on this project. I, I heard in the wind so much was going on, <laughs> but I am so impressed on how far you all have come with this project. Just a tremendous effort. A tremendous effort. Thank you. I want to also say, Mayor, that, um, and correct me, Fred, if I'm wrong, but I believe if the federal government, the Federal Parks Department, has made this one of the th uh, three top priorities. Is that right? In the southeast region, we're yes. from uh, North Carolina down to Florida. This project has been identified as one of the major priorities. Yes. And the state of Florida, as you can see, is also made the major priority. Yes. So I'm, I'm really proud. <laughs> I'm so proud and I'm so thrilled and, and I'm so grateful that, um, that the Parks Departments have just rallied around this, this idea and concept in my tourism committee and, and all of us know how hard we've, we've worked and thought about it and um, now we're finally able to make it public so we're just thrilled. Fantastic. And it will happen. <laughs> so that um, Judy moves approval of a $10,000 contribution toward the plan, second by the Vice Mayor. Any comments from Council? Question. Mr. Lawson? From which fund will this be paid? Out of your budget, of course. <laughs> the electric utilities this, budget. This, <laughs> council, right now, that, that probably hasn't been something we anticipated at the beginning of the budget year, but I have a contingency yeah. uh, area that we can uh, get the money from. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to make a comment because I've seen I'm all for the feasibility study 
But we need to be real careful because these bike paths on Chrome Avenue have been used by the absolutely no growth, no improvement agenda people to stymie growth and development. And as our community has continued to expand, we need to be real careful that there's not some hidden agenda out there from those who profess to be for our community that this is really a tool to to suppress to suppress growth along those uh, those trailways. I mean, clearly, both of the national parks that we live between have been clearly their interests are not always in the interest of of the growth and the development of this community. And I would just caution us to be very wary of what's really going on out there. And it's a wonderful presentation, and conceptually I'm all for it, and I'll vote for the $10,000 feasibility study, but we need to be very careful as this progresses and is uh, more tightly formulated. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Any other comments from Council? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Councilman Roman. You're welcome. Public safety items, Councilman Porter. Mayor, we've got a long agenda tonight on these two issues. We've already basically approved both of these Sorry. through <laughs> the uh, the initial. Um, comp uh, you well, know, we spent the money anyway. <laughs> this this formalizes it. But um, item number one, Mr. Manager, if you want to explain, they're kind of self-explanatory. But you don't need yeah, Mr. Moore, uh, Porter, Mayor, and Council, uh, uh, the first uh, request is the purchase of the police vehicles. Uh, more so for the audience benefit than Mary Council. We did add nine new police officers. Of course, we need nine new vehicles for them. And this is uh, the purchase. We do this through the Florida Sheriff's Association uh, the bid. Uh, this is a lease purchase for five years, uh, not uncommon to what we've been doing on our on our fleets. Um, and we've got the Go Sue Sun Trust at 3.4% interest, so it's... Move the recommendation, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Moved by the mayor, second by... Ms. Garner, any discussion? One one question. How long does it take to get these cars? I, uh, I'm i not quite sure, but it, it depends on what's in stock. Um, yes, it does, actually, as far as timing goes. But usually it's in a three-month period that they turn them around. So, do we, I mean, the reality of it is the officers aren't hired yet, so the cars won't be here for at least maybe three months. All these processes are going to take a little bit of time. I just don't, you know, we got to be re realistic that the cars won't show up on the, in the parking lot tomorrow. No, they, no, they won't. They have to actually be built. Okay, thank you. We'll Any other discussion? We'll uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Item number two, Mr. Manager. Uh, Mr. Porter, Mayor and Council, this is uh, again related to the nine officers and their uh, laptop computers, which uh, are uh, mounted in the cars as well as capability of taking them in. Uh, and doing reports on and a number of communication uh, capabilities with it. It's uh, again purchased on a state contract and this will be a, an out and out purchase. Is there a motion? I'll so move it. Moved by the Vice Mayor, second by Ms. Garner. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. No further business. Mr. Manor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Lawsner, Utility Committee item. Mr. Mayor, and I'll defer to the manager to uh, discuss this item as well. Okay, this is an interesting one here. Um, this is a uh, recommendation uh, by staff to enter into a pricing agreement. Uh, there's no purchases at this moment, but a pricing agreement in which we will be making purchases with the Westco uh, distri Distribution Incorporated for what is called composite hood uh, transformers. Now I'm going to start this way a picture. I mean, as we had some discussion, as I, I don't understand all this equipment sometimes, um, not being an expert in the area, but this is a sole source purchase. And basically, uh, these are uh, referring to pad mounted transformers. Uh, previous pad mounted transformers we used were all metal. Uh, they have a top that opens up, uh, and the picture on the top part is the old, and the four pictures underneath are, are the new composite hoods. The old form, uh, you had to have two people working on. You have to have someone lift up the steel uh, top and hold it while the second uh, worker connects wiring inside the transformer. Uh, they found over the years that uh, now we have another alternative, which is safer. Uh, takes one man can do it. The composite is made out of a composite material, not steel. It's non-conductive, as the steel is. They've had some 
safety issues not here but in the industry some safety issues with it not being a non conductive material and this I'll move the recommendation Mr. Chairman let's put the manager out of his misery I'll second it he said it's all sourced 10 minutes ago yeah the safety issue that was a magic word I can see how that could happen thank you for saving my pain and yours as well just make sure the guy that's holding it up strong right we have a second I seconded it Thank you, Mr. Lawson. Any um, business for me to see to Mr. Lawson? No, thank you. Mr. Hodge? No, sir. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. Um, I would like to ask Mr. LaPrade, how are we doing with the acquisition of the three acres for the school site? We're, <laughs> we're still awaiting the contingencies from the owner. So, so we can forward those to the attorneys. Okay. Um, we've been waiting for quite a while now. Are they just not responding? Um, they haven't finalized. We've placed a call to them. They have not finalized. They said we should be getting those by the end of this week. Okay, thank you. So. Mr. Porter? No, thank you, Mayor. No business. Ms. Garner? No business, Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Wallman? Yes, Mayor. I just want to um, inform you tonight at the count meeting, and then I will announce it again at the um, council meeting next week, that our city clerk, Sharon Offshire, has uh, decided to resign to um, pursue other endeavors, and um, she's graciously um, going to be available by telephone or, you know, if we have any questions or if we need any help. We've been able to, I've been working on this all last week and, and yesterday and today, but um, we have it covered. Everything's fine. We are going to be uh, publicizing nationwide uh, a search for a new city clerk, and we're sad to see her go, but... Um, a new chapter, a new page, and um, don't worry, we have the clerk's office covered, so I just want everybody to know that. Patty and Sh and Sherry, thank you, Rick, for allowing Sherry to come over and help us out in the clerk's office. Sherry worked in the clerk's office for over a year, so she is very familiar, and then we have Christina, who's, who's there with us as well, and HR, um, HR. Uh, human Resources, Marcy and Vivian, and of course the manager staff with Marlene, uh, we're all and including myself, we're all helping out there and knowing that uh, that it's fully covered. So I just want to rest, let everybody rest assured. Thank you, Ms. Warman. Mr. Mayor, if I could make a suggestion, if we could place an item on the council agenda, perhaps an add on, which basically appoints a uh, an acting clerk so that there is an official person that can sign documents and and um, maybe I'll. I, uh, can I talk to you about that, Richard? Sure. Privately? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. On the utility, um, is there an update on the appointment of a new utility director? Mr. Mayor uh, and Council, we've had uh, two more interviews. Uh, three now. Three more interviews. Four, four, four by Friday. We have a couple of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, reasonable applicants that we want to look at and follow up on, at least two at this point. And uh, we will be uh, doing further further uh, uh, interviews with them. On the, um, I read Elena under your, on, on those weekly, Friday weekly, um, on departmental budget transfers, how do you all handle that internally? Say for example, the council approves $50,000 for a certain apartment and there's a request to shift 25000 to another line item. How does that work? Is that approved through your office? Then the director recommended you approve with the manager, <coughs> sign up on. How does that work? Correct. There is, a, uh, for instance, if there is an approval at council um, and there are not enough funds in a certain line item to cover that expenditure, then the director has to submit paperwork to our office signed showing from what account to what account they, they would like the funds to be transferred. And of course they have to have jurisdiction to move those monies. Some accounts cannot be, uh, monies cannot be moved from them. For example, payroll accounts or if we have certain monies that are set aside for lease payments cannot be moved just by the director signing off on it. So provided that they have jurisdiction over those monies, they submit paperwork to our office, we review it, 
and then we approve it and post it, and it's an automatic transfer that's done within the, the system that we use for our general ledger that allows the expenditure to go through when there's a PO or a field purchase order against that account. You think that's appropriate? I do. I don't, I don't see any problem with that in the internal control um, scheme of things. I Also, we have to keep our integrity at the fund level. We cannot uh, move monies from one fund to the other without um, putting forth a budget amendment that comes to you uh, as counsel for approval. And of course, we don't allow directors to tap on each other's accounts without there being some, you know, very good reason, and that would have to be approved by our city manager. As long as it's an account within the jurisdiction of that department and, and divisions within that department, um, if there's a reasonable uh, need, and if it's something that's been approved by council, we do allow it, and I don't see a problem with it. Okay. And on the draft of the audit, on the organizational structure, I think a couple of years ago, the voters approved an internal auditor position. So you may want to add that as part of the organizational structure, as I looked as I looked at the draft um, audit. Okay. Th correct. I think if if council uh, makes that recommendation that we do um, hire an internal auditor as as uh, part of the staff for the city, that you know, what, what, whatever reporting structure you decide, then we would add it. Uh, at this point, it, it's my understanding that we're contracting with a firm to do internal audit work, but they're not really our internal auditors, and I, I might have a misconception on that. So just look at it, because that, that same thing applies with the city attorney's office. Mm -hmm. We can do, uh, I, I think, Mayor, if I can, maybe a dotted line to indicate yeah, that yeah. Con consultant, but that comes under, under counsel, and then it does indicate, as, I see what you're saying, it does indicate that we have that position. It's position available, yeah. Uh, okay. Designated. Okay. We'll go ahead and add that on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then finally, we have two counsel persons this evening that's a birthday celebration. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Bell and Councilman Lawson. So we want to wish both a happy birthday and for more nice ones to come. Ms. Walton? I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, I had a phone call uh, on my way here tonight from the Villages of Homestead and um, I don't know who to say this to, but the racetrack, they only provided us with, in the villages of Homestead, with 50 parking, uh, not parking, but you know, the resident passes. And uh, they were gone in like 20 minutes. I mean, we, and we need actually about 1,250 if we were going to dis distribute them. But unfortunately, our newsletter has already gone out, so that's not going to happen. But we have people coming to the clubhouse on a daily basis asking for resident passes. And there are none. So, and I don't know about Keysgate. I don't know if they have any, but I sure, I sure would like to see several hundred delivered to the Villages of Homestead Clubhouse tomorrow, so that if people come there, that they can, they can have it. Because remember last year, and I know Chief Spencer talking to my husband, but, but remember last year when I said that that there was a problem last year with 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 residents getting in and out of their property and they didn't provide those last year for the Grand Prix and here we are again this year and they're, and they're not provided again this year. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many years I have to keep saying it, but we need them both for NASCAR and we need them for the race in March. And I think it's very, very, very important that we provide them because, because you know, it's it's difficult getting in and out and they, and the police officers, a lot of police officers that we have are out-of-town police officers and they don't know you. They don't know Mr. Smith that lives down the road or, you know, they don't know the people. So we need those passes and they should have been brought to the um, to our clubhouse over a week ago so that we could have inserted them into the village voice so they could have been delivered to the home to the homes and they would have had them. So now we're going to have a problem, I know. We'll call tomorrow to get more I, and get them over there. I've actually, I ran into that problem yesterday. One of my friends who is, lives in the villages said that they didn't have any there. So I called City Hall and someone here helped. When somehow I got confused, they thought I meant Keysgate, I meant the villages. They said Captain Villano took them all over to Keysgate. So I was going to stop at the clubhouse on my way home and see how many they actually dropped off. So I could give them. But the whole issue is, is that, that, I mean, I appreciate that. The whole issue is, though, is that they should have been there 
long before this because they know that we have a newsletter that goes out to these homes. I don't know about Lakeshore. I don't know what their policy and procedures are. But, I mean, it's, it's the racetrack's responsibility because we all want to be good citizens and we all want to make sure that people aren't inconvenienced and we know that it is a, that it is a problem. Race weekend is always a problem, but we try to make it move smoothly. And I think it did move smooth, more smoothly having those passes during NASCAR weekend. And I just hate to, to see that being an excuse again this year when they weren't passed out last year either. We'll, we'll call them again and see what we can work on that. Mr. Matter, anything? Not sure. Thank you all very much.